Well, this morning we're on the, the last one of our gifts of Christmas and we're talking about peace. And uh, you may recognize these symbols that are on the screens as symbols of peace. Uh, they're pretty recognizable, they're pretty universal around the world. And uh, this top left one actually uh, was uh, designed by uh, an, an artist and an activist named Gerald Holtham, uh, a British guy in 1958. And it's actually based on two flag movements. If you've ever seen them like signing uh, words through flags, it's actually N and D, uh, which stood for nuclear disarmament uh, because he was very much concerned about the, the rise of nuclear weapons around that time. Uh, but it also said w that it was very personal to him because he said it represented somebody uh, with their arms kind of stretched out open wide in despair, which was what he was feeling at the time, that what was the world coming to? Uh, when we're starting to build nuclear weapons against each other. Uh, the Americans eventually uh, adopted it as an anti-war symbol against the Vietnam War. Uh, and then we have the, the Victory V sign, you know, this, this kind of two fingers, and uh, it was literally a sign for victory. Uh, it was the German-occupied uh, territory uh, where the resistance fighters were fighting. They actually used it as a kind of a symbol of strength uh, with each other during World War II. And then uh, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill adopted it to, um, <coughs> excuse me, adopted it at the end of World War II as the end of the war, and it was a victorious sign. But eventually came to stand for peace, uh, and so we kind of use it still today. You know, and people often say, you know, peace out, man. You know, and if you lived through the 60s, that was probably a little bit more relevant. <coughs> I didn't. I was I was kind of just there, so I missed all of that, thankfully. And then we have this last one, the dove and the olive branch, a little bit uh, uh, more common maybe uh, throughout the Christian uh, history, but it's been used through many uh, traditions throughout history. We get ours from the account of Noah. Uh, when the floods had been and the waters were starting to recede, Noah sent out a dove in search of land to see how the waters were receding, and eventually it came back with an olive branch in its beak. A sign that the, the, the waters were going, that the judgment of God uh, against the sinfulness of man was over. And there was a sign of the promise of peace again in the land. And yet all of these symbols, as, as much as we know them uh, uh, being symbols of peace and representing uh, peace, they were never born out of a time of peace. They were all born out of a time for the need of peace. Uh, a time when peace was not uh, very common at all. And we often uh, think of peace as uh, freedom from disturbance, this quiet and tranquility. Uh, and any of you who've got children uh, know how peace descends on the house at bedtime. You know, they're all tucked up, it all goes quiet, and you manage to sit down for five minutes, and it's just peaceful. There's nothing else to do. It's all quiet in the house. And yet we need to recognize that um, our need for peace is not usually in a time of peace. It's in a time of disturbance. It's in a time of trouble. It's in a time of conflict. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to bring peace in a time of conflict. You know, we often uh, hear the song and we sing it, this song, Silent Night. You know, and it's all peaceful. It's all just calm. And actually, for Jesus, the world that he came into and the night that he was born was anything but that. Uh, it was pretty chaotic, so much so that he ended up being born in a stable, laid to rest in a, in a, um, a feeding trough for animals. Not exactly the, the place where you would think the king of kings would be born. He came into a world that was, uh, where there was division between God and people, where there was conflict between families and nations, and there was uh, political oppression from the Romans against Israel. And that's why Mary and Joseph had been forced to travel to take up this census in Bethlehem. They weren't there because they were on holiday. They had to go because the Romans were forcing a census on them. There was unrest in the hearts of many. And when we read chapter 8, before we get to chapter Isaiah 9, verse 6, it talks about this, this chaos, this world that the Israelites were living in. It wasn't a place of peace at all. It was anything but peace. And yet, even in our world today, we, we strive for peace often. We, we try and make uh, new technology and new gadgets that will hopefully help our lives get better. And yet, they just kind of seem to add to the relentless pace of life. You know, we have more anxiety and stress and fatigue in life than we ever have done. And yet we seem to have all the stuff available that's meant to relieve all that, and it, yet it doesn't. 
Our world is still raging with wars and violence. Our governments are still uh, competing with each other and trying to be the best against other people. We have so much to be thankful for as well. You know, we live in a great nation where we have the freedom to worship. Uh, and as much as that can be under threat in some ways, there's many places around the world that you would never be able to do this uh, under threat of your life to be able to just come and publicly worship God. The world we live in is not a peaceful place. It's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of turmoil and trouble going on all over the place. And Pastor Dan mentioned a few weeks ago in one of his sermons that we're either often in a trial, in a time of trial and suffering, we've either just come out of one or we're just going to head into one because that's kind of how life works very much. We're always in and out of trials and, and struggles and, uh, and just things that aren't uh, a place where we can find real peace. But the good news is that despite this world that's full of broken people, Jesus comes as the Prince of peace. And I don't know if you've ever seen the bumper sticker that says, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. And it's so true. Without Jesus, there is no real sense of peace because he's the one that brings it because he is peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Have you ever seen these uh, Miss World pageants? You know, they have to go through all of this stuff and then they have to do this kind of speech. And what is the one thing they all want? World peace. World peace. Yes. You know, spoiler alert, it's never going to happen. Because this world is full of broken, selfish, sinful people like you and me. That's good news. <laughs> it's not going to happen until Jesus comes back. Because we are celebrating now the advent, the coming of Jesus into this world. But we're also waiting for him to come back again. There is another advent when Jesus is going to come back, restore everything that way it should be, deal with sin once and for all, get rid of the devil, and there will be peace on earth forevermore. That's what Jesus came for. But he came to bring us peace in the midst of that as well. Because there's this now and this not yet tension with Jesus and his kingdom coming that he brings a level of peace now that we can have peace with God even in the midst of all our struggles and suffering and trials. And yet there's going to be a day when he deals with it once and for all. And then it's completely done with. It will never be like this again. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more trials because Jesus will bring his kingdom of peace once and for all. And so we kind of move on into uh, the, the, the message today in terms of we're going to look at a, one verse in the Bible, a very famous verse that you'll hear loads of time uh, around this particular year. You'll see it on Christmas cards. Um, but it's important to remember that as we read this, that we're not talking just, we talk about the gift of peace. We're not talking about something abstract, like a, like a present that I give to somebody. We're actually talking about the gift of a person. The gift of peace is the gift of Jesus Christ himself, because he is peace. So we're going to read Isaiah 9, verse 6. And it says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I've kind of highlighted the word us there because it's a very personal promise. As much as this promise was being given to Israel in a time of conflict, it's given to every single individual that's ever lived, including you and me. God is saying to you, I am giving you this child. I want, him to, I want you to know him. I want you to know that he can bring you peace and joy like you've never known. That when you enter a, a relationship with him, he's going to deal with the sin in your life. And he's going to bring new life and make you a new creation. This is who this child is. He is no ordinary child. He's my son. And so Isaiah is introducing us to the Messiah here. What Israel was waiting for in terms of the one that would deliver them, they were thinking of maybe a great leader who would deliver them from the oppression that they were under. But Jesus was going to do way more than that. He was going to deliver them forever. And so we're going to look at these uh, terms that Jesus is called. And the first one is that he's a wonderful counselor. And that word wonderful comes from the, the Hebrew word pele. 
Now, if any of you are real football fans, and I'm talking about like real football, where you actually play with your feet, um, not this kind of pick it up and run with it kind of thing. Um, this is real football, uh, translated soccer into Canadian language. Uh, there, was a, there was a player called Pele. He was a Brazilian player, and he was quite simply wonderful on the pitch. He really was. Uh, this guy could do amazing tricks. He could score with both feet as if they were both exactly the same. As if he, he could score with his right or his left, it didn't make any difference, which is pretty rare uh, among soccer players. They usually have one dominant foot. This guy, either foot would work equally well. And so he was a force to be reckoned with. And I don't know whether his name has anything to do with the Hebrew word Pele. It might do. Uh, there's kind of rumors that it might have had, but I don't know. But I think what Isaiah is saying here is that Compared to everything and everyone you know, Jesus is more wonderful than you can possibly imagine. He is just so far out there in terms of his wonderfulness. He's just fantastic. He is just beyond comparability in this world. No one comes close to Jesus. Because he's wonderful, he is a doer of wonders. He does things that are beyond kind of human understanding and certainly beyond human ability. You know, Jesus raised the dead. He healed the sick. He went to the cross on our behalf, suffered and was raised again to life. This is the Jesus. This is the child that God is introducing us to and is saying, I'm bringing this child for your benefit. And there's other times in the Bible where God himself is called Pele. Wonderful, amazing and what Isaiah is doing here, he's making a very clear point that this child is God. Because only God can be called wonderful in the real sense of the word. You know, my wife and I have been talking recently about uh, the word awesome and how often we use it. And we're trying to stop using it. Because really, you know, you know oh, that, oh, that cup of tea was awesome. Was it really? Was it such an awesome cup of tea? It really wasn't. God is awesome. Because to be awesome means to inspire awe. I am never going to be inspired in awe by a cup of tea. But God, God will inspire my awe every single time. And that's who God is. And that's what Jesus is. He is God himself. And he is coming in the form of the child. But the coming of this child is more wonderful than we could possibly ever imagine. Because this is God's greatest act of salvation. It's not just any ordinary child. This is the salvation that God has promised from the very beginning when man sinned and God said that there will come another that will release us from the bondage of sin. And that's this promise now that Jesus is coming. The trouble is, this is being prophesied 700 years before Jesus actually came. But it's a promise and God always keeps his promises. And as we read this morning, Jesus came and he was dedicated by his parents and he grew up to be all that God wanted him to be. So he's wonderful and he's our counselor. Isaiah 11 verse 2 talks about Jesus as having the spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and power. That's who Jesus is. And Micah 4 verse 9 refers to the king as being a counselor to his people, being one who brings counsel to his people, leads his nation well. And you know, most kings back then and our prime ministers and presidents of this day will all have a team of counselors and advisors around them to hopefully help them make good decisions. But Jesus doesn't need any of them because he is absolutely perfect in all of his wisdom. You couldn't get a better counselor. You know, many people go to counseling these days because they need help to get through things. We get stuck in life sometimes and we need somebody to give us perspective. Jesus is the best counselor you will ever, ever go to. The difference is, uh, the, the point is that Jesus doesn't need anybody else. He's absolutely perfect. What he tells you will every time be the perfect answer for whatever you're going through. And it will always bring about the best result. Guaranteed. Never, ever makes a mistake. Have you ever wished you could have had hindsight before you made the decision sometimes? Anybody ever needed hindsight? Yeah, we make some doozies of mistakes. We really do. And yet the thing is, we don't often learn from those mistakes. We go on and make the same mistake again and again and again. And yet Jesus is saying, if you'll come to me as your wonderful counselor, I'll give you the perfect answer every single time. I will never lead you wrong 
I will always make it perfect. And Isaiah says in chapter 26, verse 3, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. You know, to, to have that perfect peace is Jesus as our wonderful counselor. We have to stop trusting in ourselves and start trusting in him. Actually do what we say we do and make him Lord of our life and say, Jesus, what is it that you want? What's the best thing for me to do in this situation? Because I know that whatever you tell me will be the right thing. I can't trust myself to get the right uh, decision all the time. I can't trust myself to make the right choice. But I can trust Jesus to make the right choice. The question is, is he your wonderful counselor? Is he the one that you turn to every single time for help? Or are we looking somewhere else? Are we looking within ourselves? Are we looking to other people? Are we looking to uh, things around us to, to help us? When actually Jesus said, no, come to me. I'm the wonderful counselor. So he's wonderful counselor. And secondly, he is mighty God. And this word mighty, literally translated, means hero. And here we have some fantastic heroes. Obviously not very real, but classed as heroes. And I love the hero movies. I love the Justice League and, and the Marvel movies, most of them anyway. Because they, they give us that sense of what a hero actually is. He comes in and does things that other people can't do. And that's exactly who God is. But he's far greater hero than any of these guys are. These guys are nothing compared to God. You think of the Hulk there, you know, angry guy, but strong, powerful. You know, nobody, nobody can seem to knock the Hulk down. And yet, compared to God's power, he's nothing. He's not even a flea fighting an elephant compared to God. God's power is infinite in every possible way. God is the one who flings stars into space and keeps planets rotating just by saying it. He doesn't even do it. He just says it, and it happens. Worlds are created because God speaks. That is ultimate power. So he is incredibly strong. The flash, I love the flash. So fast. You know, he's there in like an instant. I'd love to be able to run that fast. But the thing is, God is already there. By the time the flash is set off, it's too late. Because God's already there. He surrounds everything. It says that this whole of creation can't even contain God. He's too big. He's too vast. He's too immense. He's everywhere all at the same time. So no matter what we're going through, we can know that God is already in it. He's not caught off guard. He's not stumped by anything that we're facing. He's seen it and he's already there and he's already got an answer in place. That's why we can have peace knowing that God is our hero. But it comes by putting our full trust in him. By relinquishing our trust in ourselves and what we think we can do. And trusting God. Because the Bible says nothing is impossible for him. Nothing is too hard for him. And that word nothing means nothing. Not one thing he can't do. So he's mighty and he's also God. The word used here is El. And we often uh, read in here it's El Shaddai, God Almighty. There is nobody above him. There's nobody bigger than him. There's nobody that can do anything like what God does. What it means is he's the supreme creator, the one true God, this amazing being to whom no one else can hold a candle. He is just so far opposite to what man is Man is so finite and God is so infinite. There's just no comparison at all. We can't come up with an analogy for God and man. They're just so different. God is so beyond us. It's incredible. He is so much more than man. And when we read about these heroes in, in, in the Bible, we think of Moses and, and David and, and Joshua. You know, men who did great things for God. And yet not one of them could do a single thing unless Jesus, the mighty God, enabled them to do it in the first place. So whatever we do in our human strength is only enabled by the strength that God gives us anyway. This mighty God who is Jesus Christ. And that's why we can have peace in him as our mighty God because we know there's nothing that we can face that he can't handle. 
There's nothing that we're going to face that he hasn't already provided a way through it. We can always have peace because he is the mighty God. The question is, is he your mighty God? Have you made him your mighty God? He always has been, he always will be mighty God regardless of what we do. But he's inviting us into a relationship with him where we say he is my mighty God. I trust in him more than anything else. And number three is that he is the everlasting father. Quite a strange term for Jesus to be called father because we often think of God the father, Jesus the son. But what, we're, what um, Isaiah is drawing here is, is just a comparison of what a father is. But he's everlasting first of all. He's eternal. He doesn't live in time and space like we do. We're so limited by time. Everything is by the, the, the tick of a clock. We can't do anything outside of that time. We can't break out of time. We can't go back and make things different. We'll probably just make the same mistake anyway. But Jesus is infinite. He's eternal. He's outside of time and space. And, and it messes with your mind. Have you ever tried to just sit there and think about eternity? When all this is said and done and Jesus comes back, what are you going to do for the rest of forever? We struggle to think, what am I going to do for the next maybe 20, 30 years of my life? Jesus is talking about forever. It's a long time. I just think, man, I'm going to get bored. What am I going to do? Will there be cars in heaven to work on? I don't know. But it's a long time. But Jesus is in that realm. He's not restricted by this time and space that we have here. It actually says in 2 Peter 3 verse 8 that to, to God, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. It's just it's nothing. He's not limited by it at all. He knew you before he even created this world is what scripture says. Not just the day you were born. He was like, oh, right, I better figure out what their plan is. Before he even decided to make the world itself, he knew you. He already had you in mind. He knows everything that's ever going to happen to you. Every thought that you're ever going to think. Every feeling that you'll ever have. God already knows it. This is God incarnate. This is this child that is being given to us. He wasn't just born on Christmas Day, 0 AD. Jesus has always been. I don't know, that just blows my mind. I can't get my head around that, but it's just who he is. He's eternal. But he's a father as well. And when we think of God and how he's described as a father in Scripture, it says he's compassionate, he's loving, he's caring, he's forgiving, he's our protector, he's our guide. He's the one who supports us and encourages us and gives us all that we need. He actually says that he supplies all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It's Christ Jesus that is the supply of all our needs. And throughout the Bible, God is called Father, and this term is being kind of transplanted onto Jesus because he's going to be forever like a father to us, the one who's caring for us and loving us and nurturing us and desiring us to have that relationship with him. God is not some man on a big throne with a big stick waiting for us to do something wrong. That's not who God is. That's why he calls himself Father and why we look to Jesus as the everlasting Father, the one who will be with us like that forever. Romans 8.15 says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. You don't have to be afraid of God. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba, Father, this term Daddy. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we're God's children. He's adopted us. He's chosen us. It's not some kind of strange thing that just happened. God sought you out and won your heart towards him. Psalm 103 verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. That's who God is. He's a compassionate father. And that's who Jesus is to us. Because if you've ever met a child who has complete uh, knowledge of his father's unconditional love towards them, they can approach them about anything. When you've got a dad like that, you can go to them about anything. It doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. Because you know that you're going to be loved regardlessly. 
And the amazing thing about Jesus is that he loves you regardless of what you think you've done or good or bad. There's no list that he's checking twice. He already knew you. He knows everything you've ever done wrong. He knows everything that you're ever going to do wrong. And it says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew us in our utter mess. We can't change his love for us because his love is unchangeable. He's loved us exactly the same before we knew him, and he loves us exactly the same now. So we can know that the peace of, of God, knowing that he is our Father, eternally our Father, forever our Father. But the question is, is he your everlasting Father? Do you know that you can approach him any time, day or night, and know that he'll be there for you? That whatever you're facing, he will provide the peace that you need. Because he is the peace that you need. And so we come to this last term, the Prince of Peace. And it's like Isaiah's just got this big marker and he's put this big exclamation mark right at the end of the sentence. Like, are you getting it yet? Do you understand who this child is? This nation that this promise was coming to were at war. There were other nations that were trying to overtake Israel and conquer them. This is the time that when we read chapter 8, if you just go back this one chapter, you'll find out what Israel was going through. And not only were they at war with other nations, but their king was bringing judgment on them as a nation. Because King Ahaz was just, a, just an appalling king, a wicked king, an unrighteous king. And because of that, judgment was coming on Israel. This was not a peaceful time. Israel's not enjoying it. This is not the land flowing with milk and honey. This is an awful time of war and conflict and judgment coming upon them as a nation. In fact, at the end of chapter 8, it describes this, describes them as people who see only distress, darkness, and fearful gloom. Does that sound like a great time to live in? A land of darkness and fearful gloom? And yet, what a perfect time to hear the promise that Isaiah is bringing to them. The promise that the Prince of Peace is coming. He is the Prince of Peace because his kingdom is a, a kingdom of peace. It's not a kingdom of war to bring about peace. It's a kingdom of peace. He doesn't have to fight off enemies to stop them overtaking. Nobody will ever overtake Jesus. Nobody will ever conquer him. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the almighty God. And his kingdom is a kingdom of peace. In John 18, 36, he actually says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But my kingdom is from another place. So even when Jesus is arrested and being led to the cross, there's no turmoil in Jesus. He's not looking forward to what he has to face, but he's not caught off guard. Oh, no, I wasn't expecting that. He's like, no, this is my father's plan, and it will bring about the peace that I came to bring. He is the Prince of Peace because of all the war and the unrest and the hatred that's because of our human sinfulness. That's what it's all about. We can't blame anybody else. It's the human sinfulness and rebellion against God that causes all this unrest. Jesus has come to deal with that. And he says he's conquered sin and death. He has conquered it. And so when we come to him, we can have that sin conquered in our life. And so we can be at peace with God. And later in Isaiah, uh, he, he tells us about the one who will suffer for God's people. He will be crushed because of our wrongdoing. And it's all going to be laid on Jesus Christ. He's going to bear the weight of the sins of the whole world, your sins, and my sins. And the end result will that we will have peace with God when we put our trust in him and his saving work on the cross and his resurrection life. And you know what? That's a peace that passes all understanding. You know, a peace that just, I was just talking to somebody this morning after the service, uh, the 9 a.m. service, and they said, you know what? Even with all that I'm going through, and they're facing some pretty horrific stuff, she said, I've just got peace. And I can't understand it because it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings that peace. It's a real peace. It's not just some abstract theory. 
It's a sense that I don't understand why I can feel so at peace despite what I'm facing. That's the peace that passes understanding, that doesn't make any sense. Everything around me should say I should be falling apart at the seams. And yet, I'm just in this kind of little bubble and the storm is raging all around me. But inside is the peace of God. And the reason we have it is because Jesus is that peace. Ephesians 2 Uh, Verses 14 to 18 states it very clearly. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Peace to everyone who will accept it. Peace to everyone who will receive Jesus Christ. Because he is the Prince of Peace. He always has been and he always will be. But the question is, is he your Prince of Peace? Have you made it personal? Have you invited him into your life and said, Jesus, I want you to be my peace? I want you to bring peace into my heart through a relationship with you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is expressed very clearly here. That's who he is. It's the good news about Jesus coming. And it's not just about Jesus coming to earth. It's about Jesus coming into your life. It's a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what makes it all worthwhile. It's not just something that he adds on to us. It's something he brings as he enters into our hearts. But he wants you to know deeper peace. He wants you to know, whether you know him or not, that there is a peace available that this world will never, ever be able to give. Because it only comes through knowing him. That if you know him, he wants to know that he'll be your peace in the midst of whatever trial and suffering you might face. That if you continue to trust him, if you do what the word of God says and keep your mind stayed on him, Don't trust in yourself. Trust him. Then you will experience peace beyond understanding. If you don't know him this morning, if you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, he wants you to know peace. He wants you to experience the joy and peace that comes from knowing Jesus personally. That you can invite him into your life this very morning, that Christmas Eve 2017 could be the day that you enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ for yourself you can't have it through somebody else you've got to have it personally with him and he can bring peace into your life that you may have never known at this point but that you can know this morning 